David is an economist with the uh, with Positive Money in the UK. Um, we first met when David was an undergrad at McGill University. He actually uh, organized a workshop on financial reform that we hosted here at UVM, which resulted in some book chapters and papers and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's great to reconnect with you, David. Uh, he's currently finishing a master's degree in socio-ecological economics and policy at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. He's going to talk to us today about monetary doublespeak. Take it away, David. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, and thanks to Josh and, and Mary for their great presentations. Um, yeah, so as John mentioned, I, I'm an economist at, at Positive Money and also uh, finishing my graduate program in Vienna. And just for those of you that, that might not know Positive Money, um, we're a, a research and campaign organization working towards a money and banking system that enables uh, a fair, sustainable and, and democratic economy. Um, so, yeah, I used the term doublespeak in the title of my presentation because I've just been amazed at the ability of uh, those currently in power in the UK to, to veil what's really going on in, in the current economic response uh, to COVID. And, so, and with this presentation, I'm hoping that I can lift that veil to, to some extent and, and convey in simple terms um, some of the real dynamics at play here. Um, so the outline, I'm really going to be focusing mainly on, on the problems, but hopefully we can talk a bit about um, solutions a little later. Um, first, I'll talk about how the response is protecting big corporates. Second, how it's protecting big banks and landlords to some extent. Uh, I won't address that too much, but I'll briefly mention. And lastly, protecting some of the money myths that, uh, that Mary was referring to. Um, so before I jump into that, just a quick mapping of who's at the helm of the UK's economic response. Uh, on your right, you can see um, the, the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, who has said that the bank will do whatever the public needs. And then in the middle, you have our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and on the left, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. And they have both um, repeatedly reiterated that they will do whatever it takes. Um, and what I aim to show in this presentation is that they are indeed doing whatever it takes uh, to protect creditors, landlords, and big corporations. Um, so I'll start off with, with the big corporates, including all of those on this slide and many more. Um, the scheme that the Bank of England is implementing on behalf of the Treasury is called the COVID Corporate Financing Facility, or CCFF in short. Um, and the way they explain this is they, they give basically this explanation, by purchasing commercial paper, the CCFF will provide funding to financial businesses making a material contribution to the UK um, and will, in doing so, will support them in paying salaries, rents and suppliers. Um, in reality, uh, what, what they should be saying is that by creating new money, the CCFF will provide very cheap funding to UK's biggest corporations uh, to support them in doing actually whatever they would like. Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing. I'll unpack that a little bit uh, with this slide. So this facility is providing direct access uh, to newly created public money at the Bank of England. It's very cheap funding. We've estimated at Positive Money that it's um, interest rates of approximately 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. And it's been incredibly hidden from public view. Initially, the bank and the treasury weren't even publishing which companies were drawing from this. Um, and it was only just after a, a positive campaign, positive money campaign, where we called for a list to be published. Eventually, they, they did do that. Uh, there are still a number of transparency gaps uh, remaining, though. But so now we know that uh, 58 companies have drawn close to 18 billion or there's currently close to 18 billion outstanding but we don't know the total amount that's been drawn from this facility um, as you can see in this this um, sectoral diagram that's from katie kedward at iipp in the uk 
this was when, when the list first came out early June. Um, and we can see that it's really quite heavy on fossil fuels. About 19.5% has gone, that's over 3 billion has gone to airlines, car manufacturers, and oil and gas companies. Uh, 1.8 billion has, has gone just to airlines while they've announced collectively up to 21,000 job cuts. Um, and there's, you know, there's no conditions attached, nothing to protect workers, uh, nothing to, to protect the environment. So for example, BASF, which is a, a big uh, chemical company, they only have 850 employees in the UK, yet they alone have drawn 1 billion from the CCFF. And after having done so, they, um, they went through with a 3 billion pound uh, dividend payout, uh, might have been euros. But anyway, um, so that's, that's what's currently happening with that facility. Um, and the next, the next piece of, of this is that the, the response is very much protecting the banks uh, and the landlords. And so I can't see my full quotes because I have the, uh, ah, there, that's gone now. So um, what the government said, what Rishi Sunak said was that the government will stand behind businesses small and large. Uh, he said, I can announce today, this was in March, an unprecedented, unprecedented package of government backed and guaranteed loans to support business to get through this. Uh, today I'm making an initial 330 billion pounds of guarantees. In reality, the, the way my translation of that is the government will overburden businesses in unsustainable debt. Uh, I can announce today an unprecedented package of expensive and inaccessible loans for small business. Uh, today I'm making an initial 330 billion pounds available that will protect banks when businesses fail to repay their loans. So, so what, what is meant by government backed loans? Th this is, this is the approach that that's been taken. Um, and it sounds, you know, like the, the government really has, has, uh, is backing small business. But actually, it's just relying on commercial banks uh, to lend to SMEs. Um, so that's been a really problematic approach. Um, here are just a few headlines to demonstrate that. First, you know, a CEO was saying it's all down to the banks now. And, and I'm not sure why anyone expected this to go well. But what we saw is that the, the banks were not really, um, were not actually granting these loans and they were uh, charging really high interest rates and asking for all sorts of guarantees, even though the government had backed them at 80%. Um, so this was essentially a massive, massive failure. Uh, and now the scheme is ongoing, but what we're going to see is that many borrowers, uh, many SMEs will not be able to pay back their loans. So for the smallest um, businesses that are drawing from the, the bounce back loan scheme, um, there's an estimate that about 40 to 50 percent of borrowers will borrowers will default, and what happens when they default is the government will send, in the case of the bounce back scheme, 100 percent uh, uh, of that money directly to the banks, and the the borrowers will be left, you know, left hanging out to dry. Um, so the backing, you know, it's really just a backing for the banks. Um, and then in terms of, of, this also brings in landlords to some extent, um, a lot of people praised the furlough scheme, which supported incomes at 80%, um, up to 2,500 pounds. And this graph from, from an IPPR report shows that actually, in, in a sense, this is also an implicit subsidy to creditors, uh, because 45, and to landlords, because 45% of that furlough money was going straight to creditors and landlords uh, through various repayments. Um, the government did implement mortgage holiday, holidays, but they weren't, for the most part, passed on to renters. There's been no freezing or write downs um, uh, of rent or debt payments. And essentially what we're seeing here, I think, is that if you pump money into a very unequal system, especially relying on um, commercial banks, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to 
exacerbate unequal outcomes. Um, and then the third part is that the, the, the response, a lot of the discourse has, be, has, has attempted to protect the money myths that, that Mary has, has spent uh, much of her career debunking um, and that we try to debunk at cost of money. And here are just a few headlines from, uh, this was written by Andrew Bailey saying that the Bank of England is not doing monetary financing, meaning that the Bank of England is not um, supporting the government's spending. Uh, spoiler alert, they absolutely are, um, but they just don't want to admit it. Uh, a few other headlines um, sparking some fear. Britain nearly went bust in March. It didn't. Um, UK debt now bigger than size of the whole economy. In reality, uh, given the relationship with the Bank of England, UK debt hasn't really increased, but I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, and then this also from Andrew Bailey uh, trying to suggest that quantitative easing will be unwound and therefore that, you know, we can't rely on, on the central bank uh, supporting government spending. Um, so that th these are just some examples of headlines really, you know, I think we're seeing a, a concerted effort to um, really veil the dynamics here and potentially set up a return to austerity measures. Uh, so in reality, you know, is government debt a problem? I would say it's, it's really not. The bank is actually financing the government, both indirectly and it has opened up the option to do it directly as well. So it's doing it indirectly through quantitative easing. It's announced 300 billion of additional quantitative easing so far, um, where the, the, the bank just buys up um, the government's bonds from secondary markets. And so actually what we're seeing is pretty much a one-to-one -one increase as as the government spends more, the bank is buying up almost the exact same amount uh, from secondary markets. And the estimates for the whole financial year of the increase in government debt are about 300 billion. And that's exactly the amount that the Bank of England has announced it's doing in QE. So if you look at the, the government's balance sheet um, as consolidated with the Bank of England, then government debt has in effect not increased at all, yet we're already seeing a lot of fear mongering around that. And because of the, the, the Bank of England's interventions, interest rates on government debt are, are actually negative at the moment anyway. And the bank has opened up a facility for um, the, the treasury to actually, you know, be directly financed, where it doesn't even have to issue any debt, it can just run an extended overdraft at the Bank of England. So that is the kind of direct financing that, that Mary uh, was, was saying we, we should sort of, sort of aim for. And then there's also a lot of fear mongering happening about inflation. So that this idea that you know, if we do do any kind of monetary financing, um, we're, we're going to see uh, inflation. Um, but I would argue that that's really a misplaced fear right now. I think we're facing deflation, not inflation, at least in the short to medium term. Um, this is you know, a massive, massive demand shock. And we have seen uh, the consumer price index, at least in the UK, has dropped um, quite significantly. But I would add to that that measures of aggregate inflation, in general, actually, normal times are not that useful. Um, and they're particularly useless right now because people's consumption patterns have changed so significantly since the start of this crisis. So the aggregate numbers it don't really reflect people's cost of living at, at all right now. Um, so, and, and that also then raises the question of, of it's just another reason to question uh, the, the, the status quo of central bank inflation targeting. And then the last point I'll make here is that there's a lot of fear mongering also around central bank independence. So as Mary mentioned earlier, um, central banks have been made independent, but uh, that's, that's just operational independence. Um, central banks aren't really truly independent in the first place. They 
are for the most part owned by government. Their mandate is uh, drawn up by, uh, by parliament. And actually in the UK, the, the, the chancellor can overrule um, central bank decisions, but they, they just never mention that and they never do it because they want to uphold this idea of sacred um, central bank independence. And I would argue that, you know, really, they're not independent, nor, nor should they be independent. Um, we, we definitely need to democratize um, central banking. And I think if we don't do that, um, we're, gonna, we're, go we're going to see uh, continuously central banks just reproducing the status quo um, and doing so uh, in, in very democratically illegitimate ways, um, as we're seeing right now. So... Have we learned lessons from, from the last crisis? Uh, this is Boris Johnson saying, he said a few weeks ago, uh, remember what happened in 2008? Everybody said we bailed out the banks and we didn't look after the people who really suffered. This time we're going to make sure that we look after the people who really suffer from the economic consequences. Um, that's just not what's happening. Uh, mistakes are being repeated. Uh, I say, put mistakes in quotation marks because they're not actually mistakes. They're, they're, it's all very much intentional. And it's being repeated just in a much more implicit and discreet way. Um, and I think this is really deepening the democratic deficit, especially at the Bank of England. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we really need to ramp up the pressure uh, on, on that institution and other central banks. Just to finish off, uh, I see I'm out of time. I'll, I'll just mention that positive money is, we're trying to do a lot of reactive work on this. Um, just two recent reports that we released um, include the tragedy of growth um, and a report on central bank digital currency called Money We Trust. So uh, if, you know, if you're keen, I would really encourage you to check those out. We've also been trying to publish quite a lot on our blog on these issues and we've also got a report coming out next week on the covid corporate financing facility um so uh keep an eye out for that and and you'll get some some more details on on that facility and and how we can improve it um that's all thanks very much for listening i will stop sharing now <laughs>